everyone, and welcome to tonight's Board of Ed meeting held here at the Silas Steve Middle School. This is very nice. Thank you. Um, the date is Tuesday, January 22nd, 2019, and I would appreciate that you turn off your cell phones as this meeting is being recorded. Ellen, can you please do the roll call? Thank you, Chairperson Granado. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Cassio? Present. Mrs. Evans? Mrs. Fitzpatrick? Present. Mr. Healy? Here. Ms. McCurdy? Here. Mr. Morris? Here. Mrs. Paradise? Vice Chairperson, Mr. Hill? Here. Chairperson, Mrs. Granado? Present. And Huddersfield High School Student Representative, Ms. Eden Fritz Aguilar? Aguilar. Okay. <laughs> the board invites our Silas Dean Middle School Student Council students to come on up and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And I don't know exactly what we're going to go through. Oh,
team player and I like to like organize stuff and manage people, things. My favorite part of student council is the meetings and having fun with friends. Um, the most important is thing that we do is giving back to everybody and things that people like donate. We try to like have everybody have like a say of what we're gonna do. And another thing is I would like to continue my role in the future because it is important to give back to our community.
and one of the managers, um, Nathan Lobby. His last name is spelled L A B B E. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, good. May I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Great, those minutes are approved. Also on tonight's agenda is the approval of the minutes for a special Board of Ed meeting on January 4th, 2019. Anyone see any corrections? Uh, may I have a motion to approve those minutes? Second? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? So, Mr. Cassio, um, Mrs. Fitzpatrick, Mr. Morris, and Mr. So, okay. okay, great. So, those minutes are approved. Is there anyone wishing from the audience to come on up to, to the podium for public comment? State your name and address, and please can I remind you that you have a five minute limit. Okay. Barbara Salvin, 16th I'm here on behalf of the Lincoln School Parents Council, and I want to let you know that this Thursday at 6 30, we're having a cyber seminar for parents. Um, when Scott Driscoll um, he will be presenting, he's giving a an overview of popular apps, programs, and online trends, discussing cyberbullying, sexting, and other dangers, social networking, and your digital footprint, and using technology while keeping your safe. Mm -hmm. So it's a parent only event, and you're all welcome to come and hope somebody can make it. Thank you. <laughs> Thursday, 6 30 at my elementary. Emmett has communication to share. Thank you, Thank you Mrs. Granato. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Silas Dean Middle School. Uh, I'd like to express my appreciation to the folks in the Physical Services Department for their cleanup efforts in light of Sunday's storm. Uh, the ice accumulation coupled with the rapidly falling temperatures made that cleanup very difficult. Uh, the storm's aftermath proved to be challenging for auto transportation as well as they had to work well into last night to clean snow and ice from the bus fleet at the storage yard. Just a reminder, I'll be presenting the 2019-2020 Superintendent's Proposed Budget at the next regularly scheduled board meeting on February 12th. That meeting will be held in Council Chambers. The next quarterly update regarding our district strategic plan is slated for presentation at the February 26th board meeting. Uh, and then finally tonight, if I could just build on uh, Mrs. Saladin's public comment, uh, I strongly suggest that parents attend that event uh, this week with uh, Scott Driscoll. Uh, I think it's critically important that we have an understanding of what our kids are doing on social media. Uh, this is a real nice kind of a piggyback on what we've done through the Weathersfield Creative Arts Council where students had the opportunity for a presentation from Scott Bristol earlier this year. So we see this as a, a team effort. Uh, we certainly appreciate the work of the WSPC. You might have seen recently on Channel 30, um, Mr. Driscoll just did a presentation, I believe it was in Britain, that was very well received. So again, uh, 6.30 at uh, Webb Elementary School, and uh, as she had stated, this is for parents only, so this is a, kind of a different theme uh, for parents as opposed to students. So hopefully you'll be able to make it out. With that, that's communications. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Michael? All right, well, we have an awful lot of motions tonight, so we'll get started on our action items. Uh, Kevin, would you read action or motion 6A for us? So we move that the Weatherfield Board of Education approve the proposed transportation policy. Second. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, any discussion on this? Our 
new transportation policy or changes? Michael? Yes, uh, this policy involves uh, changing the door-to-door uh, -door pick up and drop off for kindergarten and will encompass cluster stops. Uh, this was one of those items that was left over from the days of uh, half-day kindergarten. So this uh, change that you're voting on this evening will be communicated to our incoming kindergarten parents um, over the course of the spring. And obviously with what occurred uh, in November at a bus stop where we had a student uh, by himself that was assaulted and robbed, we're really looking for our parents in our community to, to kind of step up their vigilance. Uh, and this will eliminate parents of elementary students and kindergarten students having to figure out which ones go to the bus stop, which one stays with the child at home. So we're just looking for consistency here. Any other discussion? Okay. It's hard to see over everybody here. Okay. Like we um, also <laughs> looked at other municipalities too and found that this new policy is consistent with um, many that's absolutely correct, uh, Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Uh, Mr. Kazaka is a business manager overseeing transportation, uh, surveyed multiple towns, and almost all other towns uh, utilize cluster stops as opposed to doing transportation. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, we'll move on to take a vote then. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion 6A passes. Motion 6B, Diane, would you read it for us? Um, move that the Weathersfield Board of Education ratify the three-year agreement between the Weathersfield Board of Education and the Weathersfield Federation of Teachers. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, any discussion on this? I have to say, and I'll say it out loud though, I'd love to say it, is there is 15 extra minutes in that school day, which I'm thrilled as, as a teacher, I do hope the words hurry up can be eliminated from the teacher's vocabulary as they work with these children. Okay, Michael? Yeah, so just uh, to give the public some highlights with regard to this contract. Uh, this was a uh, negotiated contract that did not need to go to arbitration. This contract will be effective July 1st, 2019. Uh, as Mrs. Granado stated, uh, it adds 15 minutes of instructional time to the student day. Uh, which will result in an additional 15 minutes per day to the teacher workday. Now, what we're doing with this, once you ratify this, is we are going to be sending this back to school committees to have teachers and administration have a say in how this is delineated. Uh, we're not looking at this as more meeting time, we're looking at it as more instructional time. There will be a variety of different parameters we need to look at in terms of transportation, in terms of other um, bargaining units, how that impacts them. So the expectation is this will go out to committee and um, each committee will look at it. I know the high school has already formulated their committee. They're already doing their work on what their schedule will look like. I know here at Silas Dean there's some interest, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Cassio, Ms. Toledo, there's some interest in making some changes to the schedule anyway. Yes, I see two affirmatives there. So this would be a good opportunity to take a look at the schedule and, and make some tweaks in the way this minutes. From a wage standpoint, 2019-2020, uh, <coughs> a 1.1% increase plus step. 2020-2021, increase plus step. 2021-2022, 1.1% increase plus step. There'll be a modest increase in stipended and extra pay assignments. Uh, high school liaisons and middle school team leaders over the life of the contract. There'll be no increase for 1920. A 1% increase in 2021 and a 1% increase in 2021-2022. We'll be maintaining the health savings account uh, with district funding at 50% over the life of the contract. And the, uh, there'll be an increase in employee health insurance premium, a cost share increase of 0.5% to 21% in 2019-20, to 22% in 2020-2021, and up to 23% in 2021-2022. Any other comments? All right, seeing none, we'll have a vote. Oh. <coughs> okay, sure. I just want to say kudos for getting this done. It's really almost amazing for you to get it done this easily, and both um, the staff as well as the administration. Yes, I agree. 
Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Abstentions? Okay, motion 6B on the teacher's contract passes. Motion 6C, Elaine, would you read that for us, please? Move that the Board of Education ratify the nurse's contract with the goes from 2018 to 2021. Okay, is there a second? Second. And any discussion? Thank you, Mrs. Granado. Um, some highlights with regard to the nurses contract. Uh, this particular contract is retro to July 1st, 2018. Uh, within the scope of this contract, uh, we've negotiated the addition of one workday uh, within the work year from 187 to 188 days. Uh, this is in order to provide necessary support over the summer months leading up to the start of the school year. From a wage perspective, 2018-19, a 2% general wage increase with no step. For 2019-2020, a 0% general wage increase with a step. And for 2020-2021, a 2% general wage increase plus step. Uh, we've also added an eighth step uh, to the pay schedule beginning in the 2019-2020 school year. We've added a balloon payment option to the pay schedule, less in the paycheck during the course of the school year, more uh, in the final check at the end of the school year. That's consistent with what we've done with the WFD. We've moved the first installment of the health savings account uh, that, that the district funds from July to September. Uh, employee health insurance premium cost share will increase by 1% to 21% in 2019-2020 and to 22% in 2020-2021. And finally, increasing the employee funding of town pension plan by a quarter percent to 6.25% in 2019-2020 and by another 0.25% in 2020 2021 to 6.5%. Anyone else? Okay. Um, we'll vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? Okay, so 6C passes. Keeping track here. We had a uh, student and program and services meeting on January 15th. So most of this is going forward now is curriculum. So John Morris, would you read motion 6D for us? Uh, I'm getting it right. Move to approve the textbook adoption for chemistry level one, modern chemistry, SRT, SRT, Okay, second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? I'm glad we're not taking chemistry. <laughs> if you read the book, you'd be very glad to not take it. That's right. To my right, this was a college level. I should also note that in uh, choosing this book that uh, the teachers brought over took a poll of the students that have been using it in the past mm -hmm. year or so, so we got a lot of student feedback. Uh, so here it is. Okay, anyone else? All right, let's take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion 6D passes. Moving on to 6E, Ginger? We moved that the Weatherfield Board of Education approve the new course, America Through the Eyes of Women at Weatherfield High School. Second. No. Second on that? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Other than the fact we were fascinated with this meeting that night. That was, it was just great. Do I see a hand up down there? Chris? Uh, yes. Uh, I've looked at this <coughs> curriculum and uh, I think you know, eight or nine percent is pretty on point. I think it would make a, a, a point, though, that there are many uh, <clears throat> people here that are listed. This is a question I'll have the subsequent motions on curriculum where we list specific texts and then we list names of either authors or figures identified with that era. And my question is, does that mean that this will be given to the discretion of the instructor to pick various source material that have been promoted, authored by these people listed, uh, or is there a specific text? For example, we all know that uh, Betty Friedan had an uh, extremely successful book, which is seen as the sort of initial uh, manuscript for feminism. Uh, 
but Celia Plath is known for, and Emily Dickinson are obviously known for all sorts of works as Alice Walker. So is, is that the general point of this curriculum that we showed? And I apologize for not being in the meeting when this was discussed. I think uh, those of us who were there could answer this. That you do see the required text on there for the course. And then the others are supplemental, which they do have, and they could supplement the amount that they need, but that would be by the discretion of the teacher. And some of them are, like there is a TED Talk in there, um, Sylvia Plath, it could be some of her work, some of her poetry. Yeah, I wasn't particularly focused on anyone individual, I'm just saying is, is this, is this, and again, is this a uh, inclusive uh, or restricted list of these particular authors and leaders or, thought, uh, or acknowledged people in this uh, era that we're trying to focus on, or would an instructor have the latitude to add other materials and other uh, sources? Sally, you want to answer that? Thank you. I would think that the teacher would have discretion. Sally, will answer it for Good evening. Yes, there are some required tests uh, identified, but there are there is also some teacher choice. Um, there are also been talked about more student choice and different um, texts. So I think it's a mixture of what you're asking about, both required for choice by the teacher, but also some choice from the student, given a variety of different texts. Okay. Because yeah, I'm going to make a, at least with this text, I would say there are other women uh, identified with other other spectrums of political thought that are not represented here. Um, I would say this is quite one part of the spectrum. That's all I'll say about it without getting into micromanaging the curriculum, which I don't intend to do. But I see this list as fairly glaring in many, I think, other potential leaders uh, who have written books about uh, women and their perspective and their growth in America during the American period of history. Margaret Chase Smith and Schlafly people that some may politically quarrel with, but certainly can be the standard. And I don't see any one from that <clears throat> sort of bandwidth, uh, as it were. Because clearly there are people here with, with serious political backgrounds, which is great. I think that's appropriate. But I'm just curious as to why there seems yeah, to be. It's definitely not been an exhaustive list. And so I'd be happy to pass on uh, some of those names and suggestions for the teachers to consider. Sure. Um, and so really it's under that suggested list. Um, gotcha. It's a place kind of a go-to. I was a first-year teacher teaching this course. Kind of a go-to place to provide some support. I, I think it's an excellent list. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying there's some other, I think there's some other perspectives that at least could be offered or thrown out there. Whether they choose to use them or not is certainly up to the class, the teachers, and the students. I just want to put that out. Yeah, most definitely. We have to pass on the suggestions of what it's going to take. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? So motion 6E passes. And Ginger, would you read motion 6F for us? Which goes to 6E and moves for the approval of the curriculum that goes with that same plan. America through the eyes of Okay. Thank you. Any discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion 6F passes. Motion 6G. Chris, would you read that for us? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. Recommended motion. Approval of the new course proposal, Cultural Change in America, with reference to 4C in your closure. Okay. Second. We have a second. second there. Any discussion? I just, again, I, I want to say, I, I think a lot of these curriculum choices are excellent. This is another one that I think it is. Obviously, good work on the part of this community we've had together. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? 6G passes. 6H. Chris? Uh, okay. Tired me out, man. Uh, the recommended motion approval of the new curriculum cultural change in America with Principal Dean. Okay. Second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? 
All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? 6-H passes. 6-I, Kevin? Uh, with the approval of the new course proposal will basically work for you. Okay. Is there a second on that? Second. Okay, any discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Six I passes. Six J. Kevin? Move the approval of new curriculum. Grace it in the Okay. Second, anyone? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? 6J passes. 6K, John Cassio? Yes, I'd like to make the motion to approve the, a new course proposal, the American Dream Reference 4G. Okay, second. <clears throat> okay, second over here. Is there any discussion on this? Don't you love the titles of these new courses? I love them. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? 6K passes. 6L, John again? Yep, before I make the motion, I too want to thank the uh, programs, student programs and services committee. I did serve on that and it is a lot of work and I thank the uh, people on that committee, uh, the board members, staff, faculty. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, good things that are going on. And with that, I thank you. I'd like to make the following motion to approve Approval of the new curriculum for the American Dream Reference 4H. Okay, second please. Second. All right. Any discussion? And you're right, John, it's a lot of work, um, especially on the part of the teachers to formulate all this. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? <clears throat> Six L passes. Last two. 6M, Kelly. Move that the board of ed approves the WHS course deletion, English grade 11, levels 1 and 2, reference 4I. Okay, second. second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion 6M passes. And our last one, motion 6N, Kelly. We would to approve the new curriculum grades K through five social studies reference for J. Second. second. And a second in there. Any discussion? Um, having taught the grade five many years ago, um, I just want to make people aware that some of the changes in this curriculum are state mandated. It's not um, our choice only, but state the state mandated change, especially in grade six coming to curriculum. When was the last year the social studies curriculum was um, updated? Was it years? Years. years. So, so, yeah, yeah. So I, you years. know, I'm glad this is getting yes. done. It's very glad. It's wonderful. All right. Any other discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? So six and passes. That was the most we ever had. That was nice. Great uh, student program and services meeting, too. <laughs> All right, tonight we have a presentation from the United Way on the ALICE data. And ALICE is an acronym for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. So do we, thank you. And I just want to say that this was a great opportunity as I have embarked this year on um, doing more in the way of external work. Um, one of the benefits of that is reaching out into the community and the opportunity to meet with the folks from the United Way. And this data is really compelling. It affects us here in Weathersfield as it does towns and cities across the greater Hartford area. Um, so uh, I look forward to the uh, presentation this evening. You have a PowerPoint presentation as well? I do indeed. Okay, so I'll so we'll need to be down front. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
appreciate this opportunity to be here with the Board of Education and with residents of Weathersfield. My name is Paula Gilberto, and I'm the President and CEO of the local United Way, United Way of Central and Northeastern Connecticut. Uh, with me is Maura Cook. Maura is the Director of Community Engagement and Marketing Communications for United Way. And we wanted to have an opportunity to have a conversation with you about Atlas. Um, also want to thank the superintendent. It was a wonderful opportunity that we had in meeting with Michael and a member of his team to just raise awareness about a very special group of people, um, many of whom are members of our family, maybe ourselves, maybe families that we grew up with. Um, but basically, the concept around Alice is to put a human face on those individuals that despite working hard, very, very hard, are, making, are having trouble making ends meet. Um, Alice is an acronym, we'll get that to that in a second. And the acronym stands for Asset Limited, Income Constrained, Employed. Alice households are the ones that, um, again, they're making minimum wage. They might be making a little bit more than minimum but the cost of living in Connecticut and in certain communities is outpacing their ability to be able to afford the most basics. And when we talk about the basics, we're talking about housing, food, transportation, child care, and health care. Um, Connecticut United Ways, and there are 15 of us in the state of Connecticut, got together six years ago to develop the first Alice Report. This is our third. Our commitment is to do this on um, every two years so that we can see whether economic conditions for families are changing or not. And also take a look at what we as an organization can do and what other organizations can do by partnering together to really help ensure that all families are financially secure and moving to financial independence. Um, one of the things about Alice is that these households live in each and every community in the state of Connecticut. So in each of the 169 communities in the state of Connecticut, there are households that are struggling to make ends meet. When we take a look at the entire state, what we know is that approximately 10% of Connecticut's population is at or below the federal poverty level. 30% of Connecticut's population is just above that federal poverty level, but not earning enough as a household to afford the basics. When you combine the two together, that means four out of 10 households in the state of Connecticut are struggling to make ends meet. That same number, 40%, or four out of every 10 households, is true of the 40 communities that your local United Way serves. Now, the good news here is that over the six years that we've been doing this report, we've seen a slight decrease in the number of households that are living at or below the federal poverty level. So that is good news. But what we've seen, however, on the other side of it is while fewer households are living at or below the federal poverty level, more are in that, that portion where they're just above the federal poverty level, so no longer qualifying for a certain public assistance, yet below the economic threshold of making ends meet. Um, my dad was a school janitor and grew up in New Britain. We were from an Alice household. My mother worked off and on in retail. And again, these are households similar to households in Weathersfield where people are working and working hard. But again, the cost of living is not keeping pace, or their wages and their household income is not keeping pace with overall cost of living. Um, there's a full report that's available to you. What we presented here tonight are just the highlights. Um, we certainly, we have the link to the full report. You can get that by downloading it online. And I would encourage you to take a look at it for a couple reasons. It's very rich in data, and secondly, it's a lot easier to read than what you're seeing here on screen. But again, just to put it in context, that we have seen this increase over a period of time in terms of this growing disparity with respect to what households are earning, but also what's needed to do a better, do better than just make ends meet. And what this shows is over the years that we've done the report, the dark blue bar, the number of households that are below the federal poverty level, um, that um, uh, next blue line or blue box, which are the households that are above federal poverty but below 
an income threshold to make ends meet, and then those households that are above. So again, four out of 10 households statewide, four out of 10 households in our region. There's another piece here that, that's an interesting dynamic, and that has to do with the fact that we have relatively low unemployment in the state. Relatively low unemployment. So again, good news story. We have more people working than worked before. But one of the challenges is, is that the growth in jobs, by and large, are not jobs that pay families enough to be able to afford the basics. Okay. When we take a look at it in terms of race and ethnicity, what we find is that, um, and disaggregated by race and ethnicity, is that the largest increases are among black households, 24% increase in Alice households, Hispanic households, which increased by 34%, and Asian households, which increased by 43%. So again, growing disparity when we take a look at race and ethnicity. The only households that saw a decrease from the last report were white and Asian households under age 25 and white households 25 to 44 years old and white senior households. So again, continued growing disparity when we take a look at race and ethnicity. Um, some emerging trends in Connecticut that we're all keeping our eye on. Um, so there's a significant amount of market instability uh, any of us that have ever taken an Uber or a Lyft know that there's a growing economy in terms of people who are self-employed and they're earning a living by patching together certain jobs. So the good news is that we have a lot of folks that are entrepreneurial. But the other side of that is these are not necessarily wages that one can count on. We tend to refer to this as the gig economy. So these are individuals that are living job to job, project to project, or their on-demand jobs. In addition to that, a lot of these um, occupations don't have any benefits attached to them. So you have fluctuating wages, and you don't have benefits that are associated. So it makes it really difficult to arrange for childcare. It makes it very difficult to qualify for a mortgage, et cetera. We're also seeing growing inequity and inequality in terms of health. So the cost of health and the access to health, as well as what's called the wealth health gap, or the social determinants of health, personalized medicine, et cetera. And then lastly, um, significant changes in terms of the American household, right? So the growth of the millennial population, baby boomers that are aging out of the, out of the workforce, and migration patterns um, in and out of Connecticut. When you see the full report, you'll notice that um, if we did not have foreign immigration into the state, Connecticut's population change would have been negative overall in 2016. Now, let's take a look at our 40 towns. So again, um, your local United Way, we're headquartered in Hartford. We go west to New Britain, north to Massachusetts, out to Windham. And then here in Wethersfield, Marlboro, Rocky Hill, in the southern part of the state. So again, four out of 10 households are living below the Alice threshold. And as you can see from this slide, uh, we have 12% added below the federal poverty level, the balance above, but not enough to make ends meet, um, and roughly six out of 10 households that are faring well. Uh, pretty much mirrors the entire state. But let's take another look in terms of what would it mean to be able to make ends meet according to local market conditions. So we're looking at the cost locally of housing, of childcare, of food, of transportation, of healthcare. Technology is a must for households, all of you know that. You know the ability to communicate by cell phone or smartphone. Um, so all of this woven into it. And what this shows is that in our region, in our 40 town regions, a single adult would need to make close to $22,000 to $24,000 annually in order to afford the basics. That's a single household. Um, and that, by the way, is roughly $11 an hour to $12 an hour in terms of pay. But we've also bumped that up against what the most expensive household is. And any of you who have had children or have nieces and nephews, you can appreciate this. 
The most expensive household is one that has two adults and has two preschoolers. And that's because of the cost of child care and quality child care in order to ensure children are off to the best start possible when they enter kindergarten. And in this case, a family of four in our region would need to make close to $72,000 to nearly $79,000 annually to not compromise on food, housing, health care, child care, and transportation. And uh, what that comes out to in terms of hourly wages would be nearly $35 an hour to nearly $40 an hour. Some, a few other things with respect to Alice in our region. Uh, and again, as I said, Alice households are in each and every community in the state of Connecticut. There are only two towns in our 40 town service area that have fewer than 20% of households living below the Alice threshold. And that's Hebron and Tolland. More than half of the towns in our service area have seen an increase in the number of Alice households since the last report was done in 2016. About a quarter of our towns did see decrease in Alice households, so that's great. Um, and there were a good number that were the same or slightly decreased. But we've seen some other trends, and that has to do with the towns bordering Hartford, where we've seen overall an increase with a couple decreases in communities. So we've seen an increase in Bloomfield, as an example, but a slight decrease um, in West Hartford. Uh, some towns, uh, trends that were inconsistent across the region, again, Farmington Valley towns, we have a few that increased and a few that decreased, so we're having conversations in communities about that. And among the 10 towns with the lowest overall proportion of Alice households, um, we saw six that increased over a period of time. So again, the value of having done this report now three times over six years is that we're taking a look at some trend lines. The highest proportion of Alice households, probably no surprise to you, go to our urban centers in terms of Hartford. Three out of every four households are not earning enough to make ends meet in the city of Hartford. New Britain, which is my hometown, two out of every three families are not earning enough as a household to make ends meet. Um, Wyndham, East Hartford, Mansfield, Vernon, um, all significantly high. What about here in Wethersfield, which was a point of conversation with the superintendent. So in Wethersfield, according to our latest report, 34% of households are living below the Alice threshold. Of that, 7% are below the federal poverty level, and 27% are above that, but again, below the earnings to make ends meet. Families are getting by, but again, making some tough choices. And one of the things that we've been meeting with the superintendent about and others to try and get your perspective and your insight as to what's happening in your community is that we've seen an 18% increase in households living below the Alice threshold since our first report was done in 2014. So we're curious about that in terms of um, your insight as to what's behind that. Okay. Are you seeing anything in particular, any trends, etc.? Are there ways in which, and I just want to emphasize this, ways in which we can partner to ensure that all households are financially secure and financially stable because, first of all, we want all that for all families, but we also know the correlation that happens in terms of health outcomes and student achievement outcomes when families are in a financially precarious position. So a point of conversation for us on that. Just a little bit about what we are doing. So Alice Households, again, so there's a lot that's going on here in terms of housing, transportation, healthcare, et cetera. It's going to require all of us to address this. Our United Way, with your support and the support of other contributors, is going to ensure that early childhood education is accessible and that it's also quality. So the extent to which we're able to provide funding to reduce the cost of quality child care for working households we want to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. In addition, 
Um, with your support and the support of other contributors, we're placing great emphasis on job training programs for jobs that exist in our region. So high demand in healthcare, high demand in manufacturing, and we're working with partners to ensure we're connecting residents that are unemployed or underemployed with the right training and certification and connection to employers to meet their needs, but also to increase household income. We are also putting resources to ensure that food is available, so it's healthy, it's nutritious, and it's accessible not only during the school year, but during the summer when many children don't have access to the kind of support that they would get through schools during the course of the school year. And these are the targets that we've established for the coming year with the support of contributors. I'm gonna ask Maura to step up and talk a bit about the Alice Challenge because this is an area where we feel we can best partner with you. Thank you, Paula, and thank you all for having us here tonight. Um, so as we looked at the data um, for this year's report, we found that, as Paula mentioned, we saw um, some swings and some spikes in about 10 to 12 communities. And so our team took a really hard look at that. Um, as an organization, we are committed to helping all Alice families in our region, which you can see is a large number um, and a somewhat growing number. And we know that we need to continue to expand and accelerate the work that we're doing to reach families who need access to services um, that will allow them to make more than ends meet. Um, we've been hearing a lot lately, in addition to the Alice report, um, from people across the country saying that many of our families do not have enough savings or assets to make it without even one paycheck, even one missed paycheck, right? And we know this. Um, so what can we do? We also looked at what great things are already happening. We know that here, thanks to your team in Weathersfield, you have some great things happening for families who need access to quality early childhood education, who need access to healthy food. We went out, we met with hunger action teams, we met with the superintendent, we met with early childhood folks, and we heard great things that are happening, and in every case, that there's more that we can do. Uh, so in uh, February, we plan to launch the Alice Challenge. And our goal is to engage residents, engage leaders like you, um, engage um, families, engage students even, and looking at what can we do to make a difference here in Weathersfield for Alice families. In our United Way, um, with our community investment funds, um, and with the help of some of our corporate partners, are committed to making an investment and reward um, to Weathersfield to support a solution that is designed by the community. Um, so our goal is to work with the superintendent and others to launch this challenge in February to bring folks together to talk more about what's behind that, to talk more about what's standing in the way and what can be done, you know, within a year's time to make a difference. Um, so we wanted to share that with you tonight, we wanted to share the data with you tonight, we wanted to share that we're here to be your partner um, in finding solutions. Um, we've seen a lot of great work happen um, over the years and we know that there's more that we can do. So we know that we've um, covered a lot and we've thrown a lot at you, absent having access to the full report, which again you can find online. But um, just if there are any questions or anything that we can do, any takeaways? Yes. Um, on the house the survival budget that you have, um, the annual income of the total that some of you have to make, is that is that a gross or a net? Gross. Gross. all part of what the researchers found in terms of um, families of means that may be able to opt into and to buy <coughs> concierge services for medical care that might be able to buy into more advances in terms of medical care than families that don't have that type of income. So it's spelled out in the report with respect to what happens in terms of wealth inequity in households 
And again, if you have the means to buy into some of this higher level diagnostic, uh, preventative care, et cetera, versus those that are more reliant perhaps on the public health system. You are aware. Absolutely. So why enact some kind of managed percentage of some fraction of the fashion in the age of policy or service which I was blood changing and flying to Europe to get specific, you know, sort of surgery to suit that's what we're talking about. Correct. That's correct. Right. 
So we're taking a look at Central Connecticut, which would be different than the housing costs in Lower Fairfield County, than the housing costs up in the northeastern portion of the state. Correct. Yes, it is. That's good to know. So again, our intent tonight was to raise awareness about Alice and point to these. I'm sorry, you had a question? Sure, sure. So over the course of the six years, uh, first of all, the snapshot in terms of all of the Alice reports have been presented to our elected officials. And so for all of the state reps and for our state senators, they have this information. For the state reps, it's localized to the communities that they serve. Uh, there's, a legend, there's a forum on February 25th uh, where the Alice report is being presented and that's open to the public. Um, in terms of specific municipalities and specific school districts, um, we make sure that everyone is aware of this. We've been having follow-up conversations, certainly with Hartford, with New Britain, with East Hartford, with Wyndham, with Bloomfield. Um, we will also be following up with Enfield um, and East Windsor is in that mix, right? And Berlin as well. And so again, I think what it is doing is it's prompting discussion and for local communities to get together to see is there something additional here to pursue, to learn more about, and is there any way in which we can partner together to impact what we can. So again, with our particular United Way, we've been working hard at ensuring that quality early childhood education is accessible and affordable to households. So that's one way. But that may be different in a community, in another community where perhaps they want to take a look at perhaps um, uh, food and ensuring that food is accessible. So we think, based on our conversations with different municipal leaders and school leaders, is that the local uh, partnership will be different community to community based on the assets that a community already has. And the additional opportunities to bring to the table. I would just add to that we have in the past funded programs in school districts and programs in towns and municipalities that are aimed at getting at some of these um, challenges. So, you know, transitioning to kindergarten for persons with no preschool experience. Um, you know, a 211 kiosk in City Hall. So, there are other examples that we have prepared to share with residents and share with communities about what has worked. Um, ultimately, every community is different. Our goal is to meet every community where they are, but we do certainly have quality examples of things that have worked well. Thank you very much.
All right, then we had student program and services on January 15th. John Morris? Well, this is easy because we just approved all of the various course changes in the textbooks that we talked about at that meeting. So there's not a lot more to add to it because we've already done it all. And our wellness committee was on January 16th. Diane? Um, yes, we met last Thursday, I believe, and discussed um, use of an anti-bullying app that we had seen um, at West Hartford and Grammy and some other area boards that are using. Um, Michael showed us um, the app, which was called Anonymous Alerts. And um, we discussed that and we're going to get some more information on that. Um, it's an app that students have that um, they can report bullying or they can report other students in crisis. Um, and that's been used in West Hartford. And I think Southwood here, Granby, you're looking at some other Stop It. Or Stop It. Stop It was the other app. So um, we're going to be doing some further research into that and exploring. Um, incorporating that here one to go. Um, Michael also gave some presentation on um, the vaping that's going on and um, some different types of technology that we can incorporate into the school to, um, to monitor that. And um, I don't know if anyone saw this, but this afternoon I got an alert that the high school Four students had to be rushed to the hospital due to the baby incident. So, um, it's, yeah, and it's, it's growing. Um, so, we're going to be investigating that further, the costs. Um, this technology is being used in Connecticut, so hopefully, maybe we can uh, cut a deal on that. Um, we also, Chris had brought up to our attention um, the prescription drug safety program. Um, and we talked about seeing if we can incorporate that to the eighth and ninth grade curriculums, health curriculums. Um, there's also some of the programs on the um, state and national level too that we can incorporate. Um, John updated us on the social, social, emotional leader to leader, the training uh, that's been going on in our. Uh, Assessing the success of that. Um, we just recently held a, a workshop for a think tank with the school psychologists, social workers, and speech folks um, about some improvements to that and then kind of rolling it out with the teachers and training the teachers. So that's where we are. Thank you. Um, Finance and Information Management Committee, which we just left. Kevin? Thank you. Yeah, we recently uh, convened prior to this meeting. Uh, Mr. Gazaka from the business office uh, noted that we are currently $19,704 under budget year over year. Um, the risk and exposures to this uh, have an increase to, driven by two major issues. Transportation costs is $192,000 uh, over budget. Uh, this is due to the number of vehicles we have transports Discovery Academy, as well as several outplacements. And also, we have a hundred thousand dollar increase for, regarding natural gas and uh, electricity costs, mostly due to the high school. Uh, Mr. Gazaka has already done some uh, outreach to EverSource to kind of uh, to, to determine uh, what the actual cause and nature is of the increase. Um, in terms of in terms of savings at this point, um, we have about one hundred fifty thousand dollars in savings for our new hires for. Uh, Resignations and retirements, um, 117,000 regarding the savings to folks that have not gone over the HSA yet, and our ADA and Strive programs uh, continue to uh, uh, save the district money for about 160,000 in savings for those students in house. Kevin, what was the risk and exposure number? Was that number? Overall, uh, under 360. Anyone else with a question for Kevin? John? Uh, I don't have any questions, but I have a report that's not on the agenda. Okay, John, thank you. Done. You're done, Kevin? The floor is yours. The floor is yours, John. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, 
the parade committee from World Day Parade Committee met on January 16th as well. Uh, the parade will take place this year on May 25th. Uh, the same setup and lineup as last year. Uh, same format. Uh, this year we are looking at uh, a theme for uh, honoring gold star families. Something a little bit different. And uh, we're you know, moving into, a, you know, trying to capture uh, a lot of different uh, ideas and uh, emotion. So we have been working with the uh, Commissioner of Veteran Affairs to see if we can locate families in Weathersfield. And like we did last year, we uh, honored those uh, Weathersfield uh, employees, residents that were involved in the military as well. So we're on a roll and uh, we hope full that we'll have speakers and grand marshals for the parade. So we've got a great committee and we're moving forward. Thank you. Any questions for John? Okay. Also on the agenda was the WEC meeting was not put in there, so I'm going to read to that. The uh, Weatherfield Early Childhood Collaborative met on Monday, January 24th, and um, the mission of WEC is that all Weatherfield children, birth to eight, are healthy, developmentally successful learners and connected to the community. Kim Bobbin is our coordinator, Lisa Puglielli is the accountability coordinator. And Lisa reported on the number of babies born with low birth rates weight in Wethersfield, and we are trending upward with more low birth weight babies. So they are working on strategies um, moving forward with this information to work to ensure that mothers receive adequate prenatal care. And PEP is being funded for this year. A new class will be starting soon. PEP is a UConn certified program on people empowering people. And I do believe this will be the fourth class? Excuse me, third. Third class, third. okay. WEC received a Hartford Foundation for Public Giving $10,000 grant for the two-gen, two-generation work. And their focus is going to be, and it ties into Alice, on family economic stability. Family Learning Program, which is down at Trinity Episcopal, has an enrollment of 10 young pre-K students, and I'm excited I'll be visiting them and reading to them next week. Um, and Michael Emmett presented and spoke to the group on our school enrollment and demographic study. This report was recently done for our facilities, and I do believe that report is available at Central Office or on our website? Correct. Correct. All right, we do have a meeting schedule. We have another WEC meeting, which will be on February 11th at 4.30. Is there any unfinished business on the board? Okay, so anyone wishing to make a public comment, please come on up to the podium, state your name and address, and may I remind you that we do have a five-minute limit. Are there any board comments? Kelly? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to speak quickly. Um, I was sick at the last meeting. But I did attend on January 3rd the Weathersfield School Parent Council meeting. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a great time meeting some of the people participating in this. Uh, some of them were here today to talk about the cyber um, safety seminar, which I will be going to. I can't say I'm excited because I'm a little terrified to learn about some of this stuff, but I will be going. Um, and they also spoke about some of the other initiatives and some of the um, ideas they're tossing around for our schools. Some of them include the Sandy Hook Hello program that they're looking to kind of implement in our schools next year, the 2019-20 school year. Um, they have a WSBC Volunteer Award Ceremony that is now scheduled for May 15th at 7 p.m. And um, they're working on promoting a screen free week and coordinating activities. Um, that week is always very difficult in my household, so any activities are welcome. And um, they just discussed some of the other items, but I wanted to just let you know that we met, and they have a lot of interesting and, and fun things going on there. Thank you, Kelly. They are a wonderful group. Anyone else for comments? John. 
Thank you, Brad. Um, with regards to the parade, uh, I have reached out to Sally Destoli because the parade committee would like to continue with the Silas Dean Middle School eighth grade essay contest as what Memorial Day means to them. And uh, it's been a you know a great uh, thing over the years. And that individual that is chosen receives a hundred dollar gift card or savings bond from the parade committee. Gets to read their uh, speech at the parade as well as march. Uh, with us. So that's a real positive thing. And the elementary school poster contest, which was a highlight that those individuals uh, are going to be asked to do this again. Their posters were displayed at the council chambers and uh, it's, people are still talking about it. Uh, those posters are in the uh, uh, parade information from last year are on the uh, website of the town. So. The grade is in full swing, and I think that it's great that we're uh, working with the schools to continue uh, that collaboration. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to the Silas Dean Middle School students tonight uh, for them to come together and uh, present a student council update that hasn't been in existence for a while means a lot. There's some excitement at the school, and I. Uh, can't wait for it to continue. Um, you know, the faculty is engaged with it as well as the students. So they starting small and then working into a, a larger group. So they've got some good goals and it's good uh, teachers. That's why they, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they've got good people working there. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? I want to comment on um, Keen. Uh, Keen on Kids Coalition, which isn't on our agenda and it's not part of really our committee setup. Um, but as I've always stated, these meetings are a great example of collaboration among the many different groups that we have in town for our kids. The agenda, and you're going to love these, these first um, stats here, the agenda started with a review of the current after school program. There were approximately a thousand students enrolled this past fall. So this is a hundred more than last year at this time with 11 added new programs. So for the afternoon uh, program period now, there are already 600 enrollments. This has really taken off. 300 more over this time last year. And new programs for this part of the year include crafts and jewelry making, games galore, which are board games, rocketry, Intro to improv Improvisation, and my favorite, a musical, the musical Annie at Charles Wright, yoga, woodworking, and Lego involved with STEAM. They are currently working with the town's IT services on putting the information for all these fabulous after-school programs for each school on each school's website. Silas Dean Middle School also has the afternoon program sponsored by Kenan Kids. New programs here include sewing, coding, baking, introduction to animal care, as well as intramurals and tutoring. And the library was represented by Brooke Berry, who reported on the teen after school programs of CD Scratch, Craft Cupcake Wars, emoji cookie decorations, and self-improvement programs. The library also has a book bingo, a winter reading program, and the thousand books before kindergarten program. 87 children read over 4,000 books for that, so that was great. Um, Park and Rec has a winter spring brochure out right now and online, and they have a chess group that is currently sponsored by the Keene Foundation. So they will be participating in tournaments. This originally started as an after-school program by Keene, but is now known as the Keene Foundation Chess Club. And thank you, thank you, and thanks again for all that Keene on Kids does for our students. And I also attended the Hunger Action, and this fits right in with our presentation tonight from Al from United Way on Alice. That meeting was this past Friday, January 18th. There was discussion of the government shutdown and the preparation to support Wethersfield residents who are federal workers. The food pantry activities have been very successful. From January to December, 50,000 pounds of food was distributed to 1,600 households. 
Thanksgiving meals went to 135 families. Holiday gift programs uh, was utilized by 101 families with Silas Dean Middle School contributing to 13 families. Dazzling dozens of which the Weathersfield Public School took the month of November this past year continues to work under Howie Greenblatt supervision. They're working with organizations, businesses, and corporations to adopt the month of the year to bring in healthy food items and monetary contributions to support the Weathersfield Food Bank. Chartwells was represented by Jamie. Do you know I don't know Jamie's last name? Davies. I've always called him Jamie. He's like one of those one name persons. And he reported an increase in lunch and breakfast participating in our schools. And he reported that 26% of our students participated in free and reduced lunch. Silas Dean Middle School continues to show incredible civic responsibility with their generous work as students organize food drives and very much looking forward to the March Madness event. And the Empty Bowl project done by our art students will be on again for this spring. More detailed info will be coming up on this. And that's all I have to say, but we're going to move right along down there to Eden. No one else have anything? Life at the high school. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's been a very exciting week so far. Everyone's favorite, midterms. So excited. Thanks for the 90-minute delay today. That was very helpful. You're very welcome. <laughs> yeah, everyone was pretty frazzled today with the snow and just all the midterms, but you know what? It only gets easier from here, I guess. Um, we're also getting ready for the annual Safe Grad Dance, Raffle, and Silent Auction. It is open to all Weathersfield residents on Saturday, March 9th, 2019, from 7 to 11 at the Pickett Community Center. Tickets are $30 per person. Um, please reach out to Lisa Musos for more information. Okay, thanks, Eden. Any questions for Eden? Okay. Okay, so at this time, I make a motion to move to executive session for the purpose of interview for the pr principal of Silas Dean Middle School and discussion and possible action on appointment of the principal of Silas Dean Middle School. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, so that concludes the public part of our board meeting. I want to thank you all for coming and for watching, and I want to thank Southeast Middle School for setting this up, and good night.